buongiorno. Buongiorno, Patrick. Let me introduce you to Diego and Deborah. Nice Cantina to Luna. meet you. Pleasure. Hi. Buongiorno. Benvenuti. Benvenuti. Pleasure. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. So, tell me about this area we're in, Marco. This area is uh, special. Is uh, we are in uh, in, uh, in Liguria. We are in the south part of Liguria, um, between Genova and Pisa. Mm -hmm. It is a, is it an area blessed by mountains in the back with uh, some of the most famous marble in the world, with Carrara. Uh -huh. We have the water right in front. We have mountains, and it's a point of connection between the north of uh, Italy, the Tuscany. We have a little bit of Emilia, so. It's an area so where are we between? So the, yeah, the the sea is nearby here. Yes. But uh, we're so just south is Tuscany. South is Tuscany. And what's north? Just north. And north we have the center of Liguria. So the first city will be Genova, uh -huh. and then we hit. Uh, we go into Piemonte, and then you open up uh, to the rest of Europe. So from a wine making perspective, we're we're between kind of Tuscany and P Piemonte. Exactly. Right? Okay. The, this is the bridge that connects uh, the the strong Barolos and uh, the elegant uh, Brunellos from Tuscany. And this particular place that we are, uh, why did you think it was important for us to come here? It's important because it's a leader in the production of a white wine that is very important in Italy called Vermentino. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a winery that always believed in the autochthonous uh, um, um, grapes of uh, the area, uh, together with Vermentino, but Ciliegiolo and a lot of red grapes that almost disappeared and they, they took them over and they worked them and to, to a level of today. So what's the name of this winery? It is Cantina Luna. And where does that name come from? Uh, Luna is a Latin word. Uh, our father uh, take this name uh, from our village, mm -hmm. for the village that he is here, Luni. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, an old history about the Roman period, uh, about the uh, Luni population. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an ancient archaeological site mm -hmm. with a Colosseo, a little Colosseo, with a, a big tradition of uh, wine making yes. also in the Roman period. So he decided to take this name about the moon, about the Roman population. Yes. And so uh, can you give me a tour and show me what's here? Yes, of course. It's a pleasure. Which way do we go? Maybe we can go to visit our museum. Okay, terrific. I'll follow you. Deborah, why don't you um, why don't you make a museum? So the, my father and my brother decided to uh, create this museum mm -hmm. uh, when they rebuilt Calune mm -hmm. uh, because our brother, uh, our father, sorry, uh, has a lot of these tools, and they decide to to create a museum, this museum, to uh, tell to our customer more about our tradition, about our history of farmer in Colli di Luni. Yeah. Where'd your father get all the tools? Uh, they, find, they collect, my brother, collect, my father, sorry, yeah. collect uh, during the year. Uh -huh. And also we ask to the local people when they close their little winery to leave us the old tools, the old tools. to collect it. And Can you show me some uh, what these tools are? Obviously a plow. This uh, first room uh, is about the uh, cultivation of the land mm -hmm. to prepare the land before to grow the vineyard, mm -hmm. no? And I see that you have uh, pictures, so how they use them, right? Yeah, we ask to the local people uh, to give us old photo about their family, mm -hmm. uh, and are really beautiful, and you can really understand the big tradition of our area yes. about cultivate the, the land and do wine and olive oil. It's, I mean, it's a very well done museum, the way things are, are laid out. It's, uh, yeah, we try to collect all the tools and separate uh, to represent the different step uh, to the uh, work in the land until the wine in the bottle. So you see all the process. So you start with the land. Yeah. Okay. 
And here there is a, a school desk. Ah. Because about our father, he always say has, you always need to learn yes. about the past. And I really understand. That's why the school desk is, the, you're learning history now. Okay. <laughs> and these tools? And these tools are uh, always to to work in the land. Mm -hmm. well, it, the nice thi the nice things is that uh, all the single are tools mm -hmm. has a story, yeah. a tradition about a, a family. Maybe uh, this tool was used mainly from the the child of the family mm -hmm. because they can. Uh, uh, put on the animal and uh -huh. the child come up mm -hmm. and run with the animal. And so the children worked also? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Every, the whole family had to work. Yeah. yeah. It was very nice because it was easier, maybe uh, pure and simple mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. but really uh, happy and yeah. with good uh, value. And these are more probably just the land you know, to, for the soil to get dig in and uh, well, it's like, like pitch work maybe that uh, that would help uh, with I guess the land or animals or yes. Yeah. And what are these? Uh, yes, was used to uh, all the little cutter to uh, cut the hay. Yes. Okay. Very well restored. They look. Yes. They look in good condition. All the tools was made mainly by wood. Yes. By the farmers. Yes. Uh, this is the second room. So here we have the harvest moment, mm -hmm. uh, and here there are so many press machine, mm -hmm. uh, and it was uh, very common to find a machine like the, like that in a family in a house because mainly all the family produce some wine. Yes, family business. Yes. And they all work very hard. For the personal use mainly, not for business, but... Oh, really? Yeah, it was, uh, the wine in the past was like a, a food. Yeah. Fundamental, uh, important, like uh, bread mm -hmm. and wine, you need it. Yes, okay. <laughs> it was, so, uh, yeah, like uh, just a part of their, their, their food. So they create it for themselves every year. Yeah. So they had a farm, I guess, for their food and other things too, not just wine. Yes. Yeah. So what, would the grapes go in here and this is how they would they crush, it. crush it and the juice would come With out? With this movement, yeah. it was a horizontal movement. Yes. And here you have torchio. To what is this? Torchio is another type of press uh -huh. machine uh -huh. that uses this vertical movement. Okay. You and press it down it. this way. Yeah, uh -huh. usually it was used for the second press. Ah, so they'd come out and then put it in here and press it again. More and so, more. Wow, Yeah. okay. And, and this basket mm -hmm. uh, was used to transport the, the grape from the... Oh, from the fields? Field. Okay. Yeah. So this is how they brought the grapes in, dump them in here, yeah. and put them through here. And the farmer told us that was more heavy, empty than the grape that you can really transport. was really... Oh, wow. Yeah. But the wood was the main material yes. to create all the tools. Yes. Yeah. And then what do we have back over here? So, well, I see bottles, corks, so uh, this room is to put the wine in a bottle. And, yeah, yeah, this room is about the, the wine cellar. Yes. So you can see uh, some filter mm -hmm. uh, that use the, the gravity. Mm -hmm. They put the most upstairs and they use the, the fabric mm -hmm. to clean the wine. So they just, so the wine comes through, they put it in the barrel? Yes. Okay. And then, uh, and then did they age like they do today in the barrel, same amount of time? Yes, that, yeah? yes. Uh, not strong wood. Yeah. It's just uh, uh, a, a, lit, a little time yeah. in the wood. We usually prefer fresh and uh, delicate. Yeah. Maybe not a bunch of oak. Yeah. 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 And here you have the, the first example of a uh, bottling machine mm -hmm. uh, to put the wine inside the bottle. So, yeah, so it looks like it was almost gravity again. They'd have wine in here, then it would come, it'd feed down. And then from the bottle, uh, they put it, it's a cork machine. And you stop, yeah, wow. they put the cork, yes. Before of that, mm -hmm. you, uh, they clean the bottle, mm -hmm. uh, they wash inside, uh -huh. and then they dry it. Oh, this is a dryer, wow, yeah, okay. Yeah, to, to keep dry. I think I need one of those. Okay. <laughs> it's like a tree. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's great. How much uh, wine would a normal family make? How many bottles? Like a lot of you know, for wine? Uh, no, for usually some, maybe some big 
ba uh, bottle of wine of 50 liters mm -hmm. for the uh, use of one year of the family, yeah. not to sell. So typically one barrel uh, is what they would make? It's a big bottle of 50 liters. 50 liters? Yeah, it's like this one, mm -hmm. okay? Oh yeah, So, but it seems like a lot of work Yes. Just for yourself <laughs> yeah, to drink wine, right? I mean, because yes. by the time they have to do the soil, you know, grow the vines, you know, uh, get the grapes, process them, they must really love wine. <laughs> it's a really big process, yeah. but uh, it's uh, very important for, for all the local people, for our father, yeah. uh, because they, they need it. They need to work every day in the vineyards mm -hmm. and uh, wait and mm -hmm. do uh, all the things right by the step right so it's and very important for the culture you know, yeah and, and to have the wine so you and your father is familiar with all this as far as uh, and your grandfather too uh, yes we do wine from four generation oh you're fourth generation yes of course oh wow so back in your grandfather great-grandfather's time this is how they did it yeah they produce wine but just like a farmer so with other activity mm -hmm. so with uh, olive oil eggs uh, animals mm -hmm. uh, it was my father uh, when he was a young boy mm -hmm. maybe 17 that decided to work just about the, the wine to make the, it a business yeah, yeah a little bit step yeah. by step but yeah. he also start selling wine door to door with this big bottle oh so your father when uh, so when he was growing up uh, when I guess what you said 17 so uh, so he would go and take some wine then say hey do you want to buy and that's how he started the business yes Wow day by day with our with my mother and but they start uh, with uh, also with fruit with uh, animals and mm -hmm. so they start selling it uh, to be well not just feed the family but as a business and now um, this, the business has grown because uh, yes. you do, uh, I asked earlier, but you said you do uh, 500,000 bottles a year. Yes, of course. So from but knocking on doors with the bottle <laughs> you want to buy, 500,000 bottles a yes, year. Yes, and wow. I born uh, with a cork machine. The first electric cork machine was near the kitchen mm -hmm. uh, and when I was a young lady. Uh -huh. And today I'm 34 and uh, we have a uh, big production, enough big production wow. uh, grow year by year. Yes, it's growing every year. With a big passion, strong passion. That's yeah. great. <laughs> was your father happy that you and your brother decided you want to be in the business? Yes, yes of course. I bet. <laughs> What's in here? So uh, this is the last room mm -hmm. and is dedicated to uh, our exposition of photo. Uh -huh. And here there are some photos about our grandfather and grandmother mm -hmm. and uh, some local people and their parents. Yes. Uh, our uh, reason of this uh, museum is to represent the, this big tradition mm -hmm. of our village. So. Amazing. Well, it's a, it's amazing that you captured all this tradition. It wasn't that long ago, you know. These your you know, grandparents that your father even yes. grew up like that. So, uh, and it's amazing how fast it went from uh, being this style of winemaking to what you have now. So uh, that was very interesting. Thank yeah. you for this tour. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, what is this place? Uh, this is the heart of Calune. The heart? Heart, yes. Okay. Uh, where we welcome people and give the taste of our wine and of our product. Yes. And here, the customer can come, uh -huh. uh, also without reservation, just come and taste all our wines. Uh, what, how old is this building? When was it made? It's dating back to the 17th century. 17th century? 17th century. Because I say, it, it feels like it's like an old, but it's very clean and new, so yeah. I, I didn't know if you built it to look like that, or the building actually comes from the 17th century. Uh, they, my family needs to rebuild it, yes. but they want really preserve all the material, yes. uh, like the past. This was the wine cellar mm -hmm. in the past. 
And, for, and it was from the 17th century. Wow. Yes. But it's it's beautiful. I mean, it, it, it looks very clean, modern, but you can tell it's old. So it's that, really yeah. authentic. Yeah. And so around these are just the varying wines and products that you have? Yeah, we have white wine, sparkling, uh, our liquors, and uh, some red and rosé wine. We have an enough big variety of wine, maybe some little production, yes. some more famous. But well, I'm noticing uh, also like uh, just the, uh, it seems like there's a lot of art and aesthetic. Uh, like I look at these bottles, they look very beautiful. So you, you, you like to present things in a nice way. Yeah, we, we need, uh, we like to yeah. present in a nice way because it, it's important also uh, about the view to understand the, the meaning yes. and the, the soul of these things that you are producing. How many, I see many different labels. How many different types of wine do you make? 13. 13 15, different? Uh, yeah. Yes, okay. depending on the there. season. Yeah. Uh, and our, some are white and some are red. Yeah. And different varietals. Yeah. The first love maybe is Vermentino. The Vermentino, so, the white. Uh, we have like some label with different vinification. And Vermentino is, is representative of this area, Marco? Vermentino is a, a local varietal. It spreads into a couple of different region, uh, regions, uh, but here is a. Uh, is, uh, it's home. It is home. Yeah. And, uh, and it's home uh, also because it finds a, a flavor and a, and a personality that is different than maybe like Tuscany or Sardinia that are the other two regions where you can find it. So I see many of these labels have artwork on it like this. Yes. And these. And then over here, yeah, like these. So what are those wines? Uh, we need to collaborate with some artists. And so you collaborate with art local artists? or? Yeah, and sometimes we do happening to mix art, OK? Yes. Uh, someone that does sculpture or paint, yeah. and we put, mix it. And, uh, and then uh, is it on special bottles, like uh, like small productions that you uh, put yes, these labels? Yes, maybe yeah. special vintage. Yeah. These are old vintages. Uh -huh. And is it different art every year that you use? Uh, different, uh, like a different artist uh, that you have do different labels every no, year? No, uh, mainly we, uh, every year we collaborate maybe mostly with some uh, farmer. I see, yeah. <laughs> More than artists. Yes. yes. So you find the farmer, find art and then Put it together yeah, maybe yeah. we we find some farmer in a special vineyard. We collaborate. We uh, buy their grape and we do a vinification. Or try new experiment, new label. And what's in here? And here, there is the the showroom where we uh, select all the local food uh -huh. from local farmer. So the local farmers create these different things. And yes. Then you, you Present them in here. Yeah, mainly uh, Italy, Italian producer. Yes. Uh, we select also local little producer of salum and cheese oh, wow, yeah. from the mountain. Uh, so you, you know, can buy salami right here, like this, and cheese. Yeah, yes, nice. and the famous lardo di colonnata. You know? Yeah, that's a, a foie gras. From a, no, yeah. I like that is a, that is a very very famous uh, uh, bacon or like a lard, uh, so the fatty part of the pig, right. but from a, from a, a, a special special area from still the pork oh it's still but pork. it comes okay. from uh, from an area that in in the world is called lardo di colonnata oh. and it's uh, it is uh, one of those uh, italian treasures that most of the time it cannot make it uh, outside of italy yes they really? do in carrara it in might make Sadimago. it outside italy with me uh, yes. okay <laughs> i think we'll have to try it for lunch we'll have to have some for lunch right? well i'd like to try it salami looks good uh, the cheese looks amazing a lot of, it looks like a lot of jams and so on. Yeah, we also do jams. Mm. Yes, the people that come here can mix wine and select some food from local producer and have a good uh, table of local food. It's yes. making me very hungry. Yes, <laughs> and I just saw a bottle, uh, a Rosolio. That, what is Rosolio? Uh, uh, for, uh, for Italians, the Rosolio is a, a bittersweet experience because the Rosolio was always used as a medicinal, natural medicinal when uh, you were sick uh, when you had a sore throat, or you were getting a little bit of this. Uh, but for kids, it was it was uh, unbearable because it was bitter. It was like uh, nasty. Right. And uh, and so now making liqueurs or making a digestivo out of this is uh, <laughs> it's bringing back uh, forty years of memory. <laughs> now you enjoy it. Uh, now I enjoy it. Now uh, you understand. But now this, <laughs> yeah, these bottles are beautiful. I mean, look, I, I, yeah, it makes me want to try all of them. Ah, beautiful. 
What's this for, Marco? Is this to cut the top off the bottle? Uh, <laughs> that can be used uh, for charcuterie or oh, oh, okay. to open uh, champagne bottles. I see, yeah, you do yes. that in your yes. restaurant, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, la, la, la sciabola della, dello, dello champagne, uh, the Saber uh, champagne. Um, Beautiful. Oh, all these, I mean, wow. So, uh, can you show me where you make the liqueurs? Yes. Okay, yes. let's go there next. It's my favorite place. It's your favorite place? Yeah. <laughs> I want to know why. You should tell me when we get there. This is our laboratory of liquors. Laboratory of liquors, okay, I like that. Yes, this laboratory born about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we met an old woman that produced uh, liquors mm -hmm. and uh, my brother decided to work with her. And uh, we kept to do it in the same way, mm -hmm. totally artisanal, so yes. with no machine, mm -hmm. just by hand, yes. really, yes. Uh, from the selection of the fruit from local farmer, not the market. So you get local fruits and herbs and, then hand, and these are all made by hand? Yeah, we, we do an infusion. An infusion. So like a limoncino, maybe yes. you know. Yes, of course. Uh, we buy pure alcohol and then there is an infusion of fruit or uh, herbs. Mm -hmm. uh, only local recipe, very traditional. Can you explain some of what you have here? Do you drink these very often, uh, Marco? These yes, they, are, they, are, they come very useful for several different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, in Italy, they're called like bitters or amaros, and at the end of the dinner, sometimes they help digestion. I was going to say, bitters are really good for digestion. They so. are, absolutely, and, and so you can have a mix of, uh, of amaros and bitters, or you can single divide them and do very specific and play a little bit with uh, your, your taste buds, so you might like one better than another one, but they all act as the finish of the meal to, to help you. Yeah, digestion. So if I, if I were to try to interpret some of these, uh, is this coffee infusion? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I have no idea what that this would be. This is the leaves of the peach tree. The leaves of oh, peach, okay, so, so has the peach flavor to it? Uh, no, because the leaves... It's just the leaves, not uh, the fruit? ...leave the almond flavor from the bone of the peach. Ah, ah, okay. We use the leaves at the end of summer. When you eat your, the peach, yep. the leaves are ready for the infusion. Ah, and, so, and that's also probably a digestive? Is it, it is yeah. very digestive, and has a, um, but it has this nutty and almost like a hard um, uh, recalling the, the, the peach, uh, but definitely more like a woody. And, uh, yeah. and this is prunes? Prunes? We know that's good for digestion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not plum, it's a selvatic fruit, like a, like a big blum, blueberry. Oh, so it's not a prune? Not, 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 a, not, prune. A, not a prune. Oh, okay, so, but they call it uh, pruny, okay. And then what's this one? Uh, Erba Cedrina is uh, an historical liquor from the grandfather of the family. Uh -huh. uh, they use uh, this type of herbs that really smell of lemon. is totally fresh and fantastic perfume. Wow. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's <laughs> very fragrant, yeah. But it's uh, and very lemony, so it has a lemon flavor to it? Yeah, it's uh, mm. interesting because it's different to the classic limoncino, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's really authentic. Of, of uh, Liguria. See, the lemoncino is here. So, so is it just the skin of the lemon? Skin of the lemon. So if you're doing this by hand, it looks like you have the yeah, device here. Yeah. You know this is the truffle tools. Oh, that's how they shave truffles. Yeah, okay. the secret is to, is to cut the really thin part of the skin of the lemon. Uh -huh. uh, just this is wrong, okay? Yeah. Yeah, because you need just a little thin part. Yes. Just for the essential oil. So, the, so that's what they're getting the essential oil out of the lemon. They're infusing it into alcohol, yeah. and that's what we need a lot of lemon just yeah. to cut in the thin yeah. part of yes. the skin. Yes, and then uh, and then this is looks also limoncello, uh, or limoncino. So what is uh, what's the difference? Because they look very different. Yeah, uh, this is the clear one, but also the, the recipe is different. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the process changed. The recipes. So is this like filtered maybe and that's unfiltered? Are or? both yeah. filtered, okay. uh, but changed the process and the result is different and the taste is really different. Ah. This is more rich of perfume about our idea, uh -huh. and, uh, but it's 
more bitter, mm -hmm. less sweet. Mm -hmm. and, and this one is this one is more sweet. A little bit, yeah. yes, the most traditional Italian we see. Rosolio, is that what you spoke about before? Uh, Rosolio, that, that you said for medicine for kids. Yes, medicine, and uh, and then because Rosolio, rosa means uh, uh, rose. Yes, and so it's made with uh, the parts of the rose, rose petals, uh, and and so then uh, worked and made it in a pleasure way. It, it can also be a very good uh, mm. aperitivo. Yes, and what's the ranch here? Orange. Oh, it's orange. Okay. Orange. I should have figured that one out. Raspberry and blueberry. Oh, beautiful. These days we produce blueberry liquors. Mm -hmm. Oh, blueberry. From nice. the mountain. Yes. Oh, right, from local. From, yes. And Bacchus. these are just the same but just different bottles down here? Yes. Yeah. We nice. do it for our customer, for a pr little present. Yeah, I mean, these are beautiful bottles. I mean. And all these bottles are bottling by hands. Yes, wow. Totally, yes. That's beautiful. Now I saw in the window over here, uh, so what are the, is that just showing how it ferments? Yeah, this is uh, an example of uh, an infusion of the skin of the lemon. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is not the, the moment of, of this infusion. We, we keep just to show to the people how it uh, how happen. Uh, so these are the thin slices that you talk about the lemon? Yeah. And then this is the alcohol? Yeah. And they just put it together and let it sit here like this? And, that's, yeah. and then and pour it out? For a period. How long does it have to sit in there, do you think? How long do you keep? Bef yeah, how long do you keep it together like this? Uh, I think about uh, less than one month. But, yeah. Depend of the, the recipe of the liquor. Yes. Uh, for example, the herbs, mm -hmm. uh, maybe just two days. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, because we don't need more that's time. True. Depend on if it's a fruit or a herbs. Oh, nice, very, very interesting. Well, thank you. That was uh, I've I've never seen you know this uh, before. Such a um, selection of so many <laughs> different liqueurs. Yeah. So so here you have you know not I know that wine is your main business. It's the main business. But when you go in the store, it's the full Italian lifestyle. I mean, you got the food, the very you know classical foods, especially local, probably to this region. Yeah. You have the wine the liqueur for after dinner, so this is the full life experience. Yeah, and the, the most important thing is do this uh, production mm -hmm. in, a, in a, an authentic way. Yes. So the laboratory is really handmade, yeah. uh, not for a romantic idea, yeah. but we, because we really need to preserve the quality of the fruit. Yes. Okay, yes. so yes. it's... Terrific, well thank you for sharing that. Thank you. This is our uh, entrance, okay? Yeah. Where uh, uh, we have the shop to uh, sell the wine, uh, put it inside the bottle. When you say so, people bring their own bottles. Yes. They, and then you fill it with wine. Yeah, uh, it's a, a, a table wine to drink every day. Uh, is this something traditional? It's a big tradition. My father yeah. started in this way, uh -huh. and uh, especially for the local people, it's really important. L so the local people come and they bring. So can you show me how? Yeah. yeah. I can feel here. So they pick which wine, these are all different wines? Yeah, uh, there are some white, some red, uh -huh. with different quality. <laughs> it's like a gas station, like a it's petrol station. It seems, yes. <laughs> the barrel are downstairs, uh -huh. okay? Yeah. They push it upstairs. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it, it, tra it tracks it over here, this is great. I've never seen this before, Marco. Yeah, really? Do you know about yes, this? Oh, yes. yeah, this is, uh, you won't try? Oh, sure. <laughs> And I can I can watch and see how much I want. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and then the prices are all shown like at a gas pump. About the liter, yeah. yes. And then you just take it out. Yes, and you put here. Yeah. And when the people are at home, uh -huh. they need to put inside a little bottle to preserve it. 
Oh, so they take the big bottle and put it in smaller bottles, and yeah, and it will keep. Well, so it's like they produce it yes. a little bit. Yes. So the idea of jug wine was really an Italian tradition. Yes. From, oh. And and you can come with any containers. You can come with, the, and then you can come here. Oh, and I saw people come in with like almost like gas cans and so on. They just whatever gas the container cans or anything container, and uh, and then you come here and you you can see all the information because uh -huh. you have the alcohol degree. Uh -huh. yeah. You can you can look at the grape. You can uh -huh. look and uh, and you can change and uh -huh. uh, and it's a very affordable, very everyday. Yeah, these Way are nice. They're, they're lower alcohol wines. Yes. I'm looking 12 and a half percent, 11 and a half percent. And this goes back to the to the importance of Italians to drink uh, wine light every day. And this is the everyday epitome of uh, drinking. And the idea of uh, food without wine just doesn't food without work. wine does not work. <laughs> so, uh, For some, every day. Sometimes in America, I see going to the grocery store and fill the jugs of water. Yes. Here we just fill it with the jugs of wine. <laughs> I, yeah. like, I like the Italian Some way better. Don't yeah. ask you no. if you want wine. They put on the exactly. table. Exactly. <laughs> just like yes. that. It's yeah. just, just, and they have their own like wine, like in jugs like this. They just put it on the table and yeah. serve. Well. So for this big jug of wine, how much did you spend today, Patrick? Oh, let's see. So this was uh, that's the lead input. Uh, this yeah. is the total. Yeah. Euro. That's, so yeah. eight euros. Eight euros and twenty-three cents. cents. Yeah. Wow, that's a very good deal. Yeah. Very and now I have wine for a couple of nights at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrific. Wow, well thank you for showing me this. It's a pleasure. <laughs>property here it goes very very pretty very well developed thank you yeah so uh, I mean I've, I've, I've approached many vineyards before but normally it doesn't look like this on the way <laughs> it's, it's very pretty. beautiful yeah the little pond. The little pond. yeah <laughs> nice turtles I see fish on this side and the amphora in the water oh well, there goes big turtles wow and then uh, these are water garden Nice olive trees, huh? And then uh, the gazebo. Just beautiful. Wow, so this is beautiful to leave uh, this property and then you have nice gates, dramatic entrance into the vineyards. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. So, Please. Wow, you got a lot of vineyards. So how many, uh, how big is the total uh, size of the vineyard? How many hectares? And now we have um, 50 hectares. 50. Of our property uh -huh. and uh, 150 uh, liter grower. Oh, so, so small farmers that yes. produce grapes for you. Yeah. Wow. And uh, what vineyard is this that we're looking at? This is a, a Vermentino vineyard. So this is one of the main grapes, uh, the Vermentino. It's a yes. white grape. Uh, Vermentino is our most important grape. Uh -huh. Uh, but we produce uh, also other grape, other variety. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, Albarola. Albarola. Albarola is a native grape. Uh -huh. uh, we have a Malvasia di Candia mm -hmm. for the white. Uh, and for the red, we have um, Sangiovese, mm -hmm. Pollera Nera, mm -hmm. Vermentino Nero, uh, a little bit of uh, Merlot. Oh, wow, okay. Yes. So, uh, and this is, so this is the Vermentino? Grape? Yes. So this is... Uh, how big is it? A larger or small, smaller size grape uh, when it matures, when it gets fully grown? Uh, it's a normal, normal, normal size, yes. It's a, it's a typical uh, grape yeah. of Vermentino. And uh, it's, it's a uh, grape that grows well in the heat, or what, what are the characteristics of this grape? Uh, in this area, uh, Vermentino is uh, fresh, delicate, mm -hmm. uh, very fruity, mm -hmm. uh, um, good minerality. Yes. Uh, very good for the uh, fish. Oh, for fish, yeah. How do you describe this, uh, this wine when you're talking to customers? It's, a, it's a easy to drink, very floral. It has a very gentle nose. Um, it has a, a very simple palate mm -hmm. and, um, and a, medium, uh, and a medium finish. The, the, uh, the dirt seems very dry right now. Do you dry farm here or do you irrigate? 
Uh, el, dai la, um, si, si da l'acqua si, si, si aiutano le vigne no. con l'acqua no. no. Uh, so this is the total dry farming. So it's total dry farming again. Wow. Yeah. So it's very natural process. Yes, yeah. we work uh, with a very traditional mm -hmm. uh, philosophy, mm -hmm. a very natural philosophy. Uh, we don't use uh, this herb. Uh, no pesticides. No uh, pesticides. So it's organic, basically. Yes. yes. And uh, with every vineyard is hand, uh, hand picked. Oh, it's, you hand pick all these vineyards? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Hand picked all 50 hectares and all hand uh, um, um, taken care. Yes. So all the, like when they're uh, separating and that's all done by hand, no machines? No machines. Wow. wow. Yeah. And, uh, and how long, because your father started just very small, you know, uh, selling bottles door to door. When did the when did the vineyard start to grow and, and become so much bigger as far as the amount of wine that you make? Il, il papà aveva cominciato con poco, quindi con piccole vigne. Da quando è cominciato a diventare una cosa un po' più un po' più grande? A partire dagli anni 70. Yeah, so from the 1970, uh, the, the production started to get a little bit bigger, and uh, uh, the father that used to, to work in an industry just uh, kept uh, wine uh, as a full-time job, and everything grew until today. And what is your favorite part? You're involved in the farming yeah. and in the winemaking. Um, what is your favorite part of your work? What do you like best? Uh, my my winery is my house. I love the this place. I love uh, every part of the of our uh, work. Yes, uh, is a uh, very very important for me. Are the vineyards in different locations? They have different characteristics. Uh, so are they all pretty much the same? Uh, we have uh, three different terroirs. Uh -huh. uh, one, uh, uh, one terroir is uh, very close to the sea. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, sandy soil. Mm -hmm. uh, and this part, we, uh, we produce a, a very, uh, the, the white wine and the red wine, mm -hmm. fresh, delicate. Yes. The second terroir is in this area, mm -hmm. uh, very close to the hills. Yes. Uh, medium, medium soil, uh, alluvional soil. And then in this area, we produce our classic label, Etichetta Grigia, Auxo. Uh, our most important production is in this area. This area here? Yes. Okay. And uh, we, we have a, uh, another terroir on the hills. Up in the hills over yes. here? Yes. Yeah. Uh, on the hills, uh, we have uh, a very nice uh, vineyard uh, with very nice view from the sea, a very beautiful terroir. Mm -hmm. Uh, microclimate is very good, and uh, in this area we produce uh, white and red uh, with uh, complexity, good mi minerality. Mm -hmm. uh, our etichetta nera, uh, our uh, most important uh, label is product. Your, your single vineyard, uh, yes. Vermentino, that, yes. comes, that, from comes, the, that comes from the hills. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's interesting that, uh, that you have you know, three distinct different wines, but it all has to do with where the locations are. They're not really that far apart, but the microclimate's very different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for this vineyard, for, the, you know, for these grapes here, when, when, is, uh, when do you think they'll be ready for harvest? Uh, in this year, I think uh, to, the, to the end of the August, End of August? Yeah. yeah, in the end of the August. Because I can feel a lot of heat right here, so probably a little earlier harvest, right? And uh, they look like they're developing nicely. You feeling good about this season? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we have a good potential. It's a good, uh, good vintage for me. Terrific. Well, Diego, thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. And sorry for my English. No, your English is great. <laughs> Better than my Italian. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie, Diego. Grazie. Deborah and Diego really create a magical experience at Calune. And I have to tell you that they were very gracious hosts and we had a remarkable time there, not only in the touring of the facility, but then they fed us a beautiful meal after we were done just to round out the experience. These Italians really know how to live, I'll tell you that. So thanks for joining us. Sometimes I'll hear an expert say, this wine is very well balanced. What does that mean? 
Uh, so it usually refers to uh, the components of the wine, so uh, the sugar, acidity, and tannicity of the wine. Mm -hmm. When you say it's a very round, very balanced wine, means that all these three are very uh, equal to each other. Nothing stands out. And what's the experience of that like? So if I'm drinking that and, and I'm drinking well-balanced wine, is it, is it going to be like there's no sharp edges or what is it going to feel like? Exactly. It usually tastes uh, very round, very easy to drink. Uh, it doesn't create a lot of acidity in your mouth. It doesn't create a lot of imbalances. Mm. It's, it's very round, it's very um, unified and, uh, and, and clean. Another term that I hear very often is complexity. Oh, this is a very complex wine. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, complexity is when all these components of the wine come together and, and elevate the wine. Sometimes you drink a wine and the only thing that you get out of the wine is maybe acidity or just some, some white wines that maybe also only taste like lemon. Mm -hmm. Some red wine, they taste maybe only sugar. Mm -hmm. So those are incomplete wines or they're not complex because they don't have the other components. Uh, structure is one of them. Mm -hmm. So tannic, uh, sugar, and color, mm -hmm. and acidity, they all come together and they elevate the wine. It becomes a complex wine. So when it's complex, it's a, if it's described that way, it's a good thing. It's, it's like, a, you know, it's something that's deeper or maybe a, a better quality of wine. It, it is, and most of the time also comes with a certain amount of age because mm -hmm. uh, complexity comes with the, the wine aging mm -hmm. for, for a little bit of, of time. So you're saying as a wine ages, it normally increases in its complexity? Most of the times, yes. Um, it, it definitely settles and, and uh, it gives a little bit of time to adjust and, uh, and come together. My next interview is with Marian Simcic. When we first went to Slovenia, I remember pulling into town and going to this really high-end restaurant that served beautiful food. And I looked over my shoulder and this gentleman walked in who looked a little bit like a movie star. Had the dark glasses on, who's dressed really nice, and he had a certain air about him. And that was Marian Simcic. If you remember me telling you the story about Slovenia and how they were under communist rule and producing low-quality, high-volume wines, and when that all changed, Marion is the leader who basically got the winemakers together and said, we can do this on a world-class level now. Let's go after this. Let's turn Slovenia into a very special, very well-known winemaking region that the rest of the world can respect. So enjoy my interview here with Marion Simčić. And one other thing I want to add is that they hosted us for dinner one night after we were filming and you want winemakers to host you, and especially after they start drinking for a while, because we're there, I think, till about one o'clock in the morning, and he kept going downstairs into the cellar and pulling out older and older wines, bringing them back, saying, we have to try this, we have to try this. He was an amazing host. He has a passion, not only for his own wines and making wine, but he's got a passion for the winemaking region of Berta, which is in Slovenia, and has inspired other winemakers to step up their game there. Check this out. And thank you for inviting us to this beautiful place. I, there's a meal that's uh, being prepared for us, so I'm very much looking forward to that. And I smell beautiful food coming in. <laughs> so you know how to live well. So does uh, the life of a, of a winemaker, uh, is it always this good? 
Yeah, it's <laughs> very dynamic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Special now for harvest and uh, this year is like two weeks, uh, two weeks uh, early. For this is um, many think now is the masterclass, many visit and the other part is my job is uh, in the cellar in the vineyards. For this is, mom, I'm um, and in good condition where you the start. Yeah. When you the finish after one month is a little bit tired. But yeah. now it's full energy. Full energy. Exciting. And everything around is beautiful. I see the sunset behind you, it's very, very nice. So you live in a in a in a wonderful place. But this land has a history, right? Uh, from before World War II, after World War II, and your fifth generation? Yeah, me is the family Simcic. Uh, start making wine in 1860. Is um, wow. is uh, Joseph Simcic after his grand grandfather. After Joseph is Anton. Mm -hmm. After Anton is Theodore. Is my grandfather. Salco, my father, and now me. And maybe is Leonardo is the the next next uh, to sixth generation. Has it always been on this land uh, where the grapes were grown? Yeah, some of the vineyards, uh, more of the 20 hectares, is the property of a um, family. Mm -hmm. And for this is the um, all five generations work in the same, uh, in the same terroir, in the same vineyards. This is, uh, is so important, the experience to, um, to work in, uh, in the vineyards, you know, every square meter, mm -hmm. what is the soil, what is the condition, the microclimate. What is the Burda Hills is the very dynamic uh, terroir. Mm -hmm. For this is in the very small area is very different micro terroir. For this is uh, this is not in in the book. It's not possible uh, learning in another part. It's just with experience, and uh, I'm very happy. What is uh, I work uh, professional with my father 28 years, mm -hmm. and all experience to my grandfather. My father now it's. Um, it's hope very good for the make wine, special make wine on an organic way and biodynamic where it's not uh, industrial where it's not much touch in the cellar. It's uh, more part of the, our job is uh, making the in the vineyards. Through all this time, uh, since the 1800s when your family started, uh, there's been a lot of change in the land as far as who owned it and what country it was. Yeah, whereas in many time in, uh, in this five generation is the change um, the border, like the border of the states is uh, the first is the Venetian Republic. After Venetian Republic is Austro-Hungarian Imperial. Also, after Austro-Hungarian Imperial is 100 year after the first war to second to finish the second war is here is Italy. Mm -hmm. After the Second War in 47 is to make the border in our village in Ceglo, which our village is half in Slovenia, half in Italy. Uh -huh. And it's a Yugoslavia for 40, uh, 40 years to 47 to 91. Yeah. And 91 is Slovenia in independence and um, now it's Europe. I very like where it's uh, now it's not border, it's, right. uh, it's open. It's live in two villages, in two states, my, it's for us. For people here, is um, it's like wine time, where the the time of the Italy or Austro-Hungarian, whereas the border from Yugoslavian regime is a little bit more close. Right. Special the small border is open just in the day, like seven a.m. to seven p.m. So for you, you got to see it go from Yugoslavia back to Slovenia and being its own. Its own country now. Yeah, for this our old um, label is produced in Yugoslavia, or more old is produced in Italy from uh, from my father, my grandfather. For this is ma, the vineyards in the same place is not change. Is the yes. change the border, and border is not political. Whereas here is special in the Italian side of the Colio of Berda. It's called Colio. Mm -hmm. Is the more uh, Slovenian national people. For this is uh, here is uh, is mix and uh, is the people um, live in different uh, states. My is the B language. All all people here is to speak Slovenian and Italian. It, it's amazing though. Through all these generations, there's been so much change. You know, uh, politically, so much change in the countries. 
Uh, but what's the same is the fact that you're on this land, your family's on this land, you make wine. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so the, no matter what's happening in the world. The wine business work, uh, especially in this way, like family is, um, is very personal, mm -hmm. is the people more inside, where is, uh, is the terroir is all together. No, it's a microclaim, soil yeah. and people. And people who is uh, experienced in the make with with tradition, for this is it's not a job to start and maybe after ten years is change is finished. With uh, make one good good wine like top wines is the vineyards who plant is the good fruits is for next generation. Like me, I'm now best fruits who is uh, plant my father right. and my grandfather. Some vineyards where is any time is the is replanting the change is with the plant me like now is the vineyards 10, 10, 12 years, 20 years uh, is good top fruits is from Leonardo. Interesting. For this is the is the business in very long and a long way now. Yes, it's a very much a, a legacy business that uh, you're doing things today that 10, 20, 30 years in the future that the benefits come. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, many times when you start work is not make like um, economic mathematic one plus one it's two. Here is the formula is uh, just make good and after the time is the come result. Yeah. And where is the absolutely is the passion is so important and uh, all team uh, is to grow in the one um, to one direction for many years and after this is the result. Did you have a concern that maybe your son wouldn't want to be in the wine business? Yeah, I hope. What is uh, yeah. <laughs> just one son? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I hope maybe he's uh, still um, with us. With with uh, our our life is not private life and business. We all family and uh, live here. Where is the cellar? Close to the vineyards, and uh, our time is not eight hour. The finish is uh, work when you work all day or some days the um, sunday saturday what is the important to make something in the cellar or in the vineyards for this is when you make with uh, nature is not uh, it's not um, hour or directly daily then just five days for this is uh, our our life and my wife and all uh, my parents and uh, is hope all my sister and my cousin is work uh, with me. It's it's important. What is um, or not making this way is a result that is not uh, is not coming. What are the most important things for you as a winemaker that you think about? It's uh, always complex. It's first is the vineyards and the work, and after is uh, make vinification is uh, important uh, so pure so so clean and to know to sometime is uh, live in the very straight uh, street mm -hmm. and this is experience to to go in in, in, in maximum we don't uh, touch special to make wine without sulfite and another without selection or yeast for this is um, is many small thing in the finish is uh, the make um, difference. Yeah, your wines have won many awards. So does that make you feel good uh, when when you get an award for your yeah. wine? Yeah, for me it's so important. When you where you were 22 years ago, I make some stage in uh, in France, in Burgundy, and visit uh, many producer. And the same is uh, like size, like us, family small uh, winery um, and look you know, like tasting room like here and it's the map of the world and this in this map uh, is in many country is some um, some emblem and then what is uh, this now when you use this um, blend in the map is the our wine I sell our wine uh, wine in this uh, place now so nice one time where is uh, my father where it's not easy to sell, especially in the time of Yugoslavia, it's not possible export. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the 91, you start um, with my father export uh, to Italy, Austria, here Germany. And the uh, same in 92, his first export in the United States and uh, in New York. And now I'm like uh, this uh, producer, I sell 
like all the world, in New Zealand, in Japan, in, in Asia, in the States, in the Sud, in the South America, in Europe, in the 43 market. Mm -hmm. It's the very boutique where our wines is not uh, wines for supermarket, mm -hmm. just to the the gourmet restaurants, special wine shop, wine bars, uh, where is um, is the quality wine for the people, where is the culture the wine. And for this is uh, our market, especially is like France, Italy, Germany, especially New York, California, um, Japan, where is the good culture of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of the wine, where is yeah. the people know, where is all world is, uh, in the market, ma, it's where is um, the culture of the wine is uh, for our wines is uh, its place. I know uh, that your father passed away uh, recently, and I'm very sorry. Uh, was it exciting for him uh, to see now that you can send your wines to the world, since so much of his life was when it was still Yugoslavia? Yeah, my my father is all these five generation is uh, my father is. Uh, the bad, uh, the bad time is uh, in all the story, the family Simcic, where is, uh, is uh, the regime in Yugoslavia is not good for a private producer. Right. It's just to more focus to the cooperative, the, the big production. Mm -hmm. What is the Yugoslavian market is big, like uh, 10 times more like now in Slovenia. Yeah. And it's, this is all is produced is um, to sell to um, this market. Now when you sell the domestic market is, is look the price is the more um, commercial wine. No, it's not place to make just the high quality yeah. boutiques uh, wine. For this is just is the market like now Croatia, yes. Serbia, another republic uh, of um, of ex Yugoslavia. Um, this is is not um, it's not this competition like uh, make me now. Mm. Where is the is competition in the market? No. Every producer possible, uh, I make good wine. It's the best is when you sell in the market where is the all wine in the market, like London, no? It's UK, London is a very great market for us, where it's, it's open. It's mm -hmm. UK is not produced very small, uh, mm -hmm. it's produced the, the wine, and it's, uh, it's open to New World wine, like to New Zealand, to California, South African uh, wine, to traditional from France, from Italy, from Spain, from Portugal, and where you many is uh, people where you learn in the old school, the sommelier, master sommelier, master one, all critics is in this part, and uh, mm -hmm. many sommelier come to make experience, to make the stage and work in the wine bars and the shop and the restaurant, and it's very dynamic, very dynamic market, and you possible sell like in the place like this is. <laughs> This is, is for me is uh, best uh, best critic and I say in many years and to repeat and all best place Michelin star restaurant mm -hmm. special wine shop uh, is uh, our wines is in in the in the list. What was the most important lessons you learned from your father? Yeah, uh, first is uh, <laughs> make uh, when you start like all um, young um, people generation. Uh, it's um, it's like change, no? Yeah. That is, this is, is uh, maybe my son when the start makes series is like change everything. In production, it's not in wine is possible. A little bit. My father is that uh, okay? Make one wine, one thing to in your in your way where I, I make this wine school, and for this is uh, make something different. But mm -hmm. it's important not make so much little bit change this year after taste the wine, look the result that it's in wine or in vineyards, it's not possibly like change in the black and white. No? <laughs> For this is my father is the my sense is uh, so important work with uh, sensibility, no? It's uh, grapes, new grapes, like, like vineyards. And the same, they smell the taste, the grapes, mm -hmm. smell the, um, the juice, smell the wine, and it's not so aggressive. It's important to work with uh, with uh, st with some steel, with uh, some personal uh, touch. Mm -hmm. And after you learn, it's good to make some experience. And yes. I'm after this year is the third in my my harvest, mm -hmm. and I make now some some experience. I'm making the small quantity. 
and after you look the result that is not uh, changed. What is uh, so important in the market, who, who drink uh, Marian Simcic wines or, or Simcic wines for many years, it's not, uh, it's not uh, change uh, the style of the wine, no? It's changed a little bit or the vintage, whereas the, um, the weather is not every year the, the same. Yeah. For, this is, is the, for this is the important winemaker to, to using to vinification maybe different in different, uh, in different uh, vintage, mm-hmm. where it's, uh, it's different weather, different condition to make very very similar mm. it's not make like coca-cola it's some wine is like coca-cola is every year the same no mm. it's important so but it's not changed so much for this some wine especially in the opoca the grand cru mm. wine when you not good vintage i this year not make it it's not in the market where is there's so much difference for this is this is the one guarantee for the label for the market and this is people uh, pricing for uh, the, this continuity, the, the, the quality and the style of the wine. Thank you very much for the tour today and teaching us so much about wine and, and sharing your passion. Thank you for coming and uh, see you tomorrow in the vineyards yes. to make the harvest. Yes. <laughs> Juice the Pinot Noir and now to look at how much the sugar. Uh... Man, this is the juice right from the grapes yes. that they just crushed outside. Yeah, okay. this is just the crash, is the first juice of the Pinot Noir uh-huh. 2018. And uh, now you look how much sugar is in this juice. For me, just I taste this very high. This is, is sugar, and another part is the alcohol. Ah. And what's it showing? This is, this is 20 and half mm-hmm. and more. The temperature is the calibration is the 15 degrees. And now it's 22. Mm-hmm. It's another zero three more. Uh-huh. It's 20.8. This is about the alcohol is 13.5 of uh, alcohol. This is, is it's perfect. Is, is that perfect? Yes, it's good. It's perfect, yeah. So does this help uh, you determine in the winemaking what to do next based on how much sugar, how much alcohol? Yeah, yeah. This is normal. This is, is opposite side. Is yeah. Where is the sugar, where they consume the sugar is the come alcohol. Yeah. For this, uh, it's how much sugar well, and the finish comes how, how much yeah. alcohol. Yeah. It's very, it's very sweet. It's possible yeah. taste the, the juice. Mm-hmm. This is just the color without skin contact. When you fermentation, the co- mm-hmm. color, color is intense. Oh, boy, is that delicious? <laughs> it's so good. It's so, oh, it's so, so good. sweet and the mm-hmm. nice balance to acidity for this. Yes. Is We're excited about 2018. Yes, 2018 yes. is one of the very great uh, vintage. Yeah. Mm. Cheers. 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 So now the juice just came in from outside, right? Yeah, yeah. Now what happens? And now they come in the tank, no? Is the tank from fermentation is this tank? Here. So this this yeah. goes all the way outside and comes straight to the tank. The tank now it's Pinot Noir in inside, and this tank is the possibility to the control the the temperature. Uh-huh. And another is the automatically the keep down the, the skin. The skin. When is the fermentation? Is the skin going up? Uh-huh. And another thing is make the lestage. Every some hour is the program to program to the make the to the juice in upstairs, yeah, the circulate. Okay. Just four time a uh, four time a day. Yes. And you said five, and how long minutes. will you leave the skins with the wine? Sixteen days. Sixteen, 16 days. Sixteen days. And then after the sixteen days, what will happen? Yes, pressing. Yeah. And after pressing, go in the tank for two weeks, mm-hmm. uh, two three weeks, and after two and a half year in the small wooden barrel. Ah. Where is Pinot Noir all? Or that wine is in uh, in the wood barrel. In the wood barrel, yes. and they use the uh, French oak. Uh, yes, is the ninety percent is the French oak and ten percent is the Slovenian. Uh, oh, nice, nice. So, Marion, I, I noticed these uh, cement. Uh, what are, what are these eggs that are here? 
Yes, this is X shape. It's X from cement. It's the very special cement. Where is um, first is alimentar. Yeah. It's not additive, and is the for the process to micro oxygenation is very important. Special for the ribola. The, so our, the ribola, uh, grape. ribola grape is the fermentation like Pinot Noir about 16 days with the skins. So are you saying that it oxygenates through yes. the cement? Yes, yeah. especially in first time when it's the shape with the put, this is the manual, mm -hmm. not like the tank is the make uh, automatic. Mm -hmm. This is the, uh, the manual that put the skin down. It's four times a, a day. And after the fermentation is pressing. Mm -hmm. And after pressing it stay here one year. And in this one year is the wine with the micro oxygenation is important to to the tannins, the matter of all phenols and tannins. And after one year here, it's going in the, another cellar, in the wood another year. This wine in the bottling after two years. And uh, the Rebola wine that you're making uh, is getting very good reviews. Yeah, yeah. Rebola is our important uh, variety. First, this local from here is the very old variety. Yeah. And um, it's uh, the, the skinks of uh, Rebola is the very deep. It's the more like uh, the Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc. For this is good to make to extraction, to maceration, mm -hmm. where it's very tasty of terroir and the phenols in inside. It's not just in the juice, it's uh, inside. And like Chardonnay Sauvignon who makes so much the maceration is extract extracted so much. Ribola in, in the start is not like extracted and the high sugar like uh, Chardonnay and Sauvignon. Right. But with this phenol it's come very nice uh, balance. After you, you try some... Uh, I heard one. there was uh, one, one Italian wine critic said that, that this white wine was the best white wine in the yes, world. Yes, uh, last year is our, uh, the vintage 16, we now ready to start sell. It's 99 points to Luca Gardini, is the best sommelier of the world. Wow. In the competition 2010, now is one of the three best critics in Italy. And the make, every year is the make list of 50 best wine of the world mm -hmm. for all region. And last year is the our Rivola is in uh, in the first place. So when when your wines are rated that high, do you feel pressure every year that you have to keep performing? Yeah, my, for us it's every year is pressure. Where is um, every year is a new and some more experience. Yes. Now me this uh, harvest is thirty harvest. Uh, my 30, 30th yes, harvest. Yes, uh, thirty harvest. Oh wow. So first is. 88. Yeah, wow. It's make with my father. My first time is to make some wine in my vision, my philosophy. That's, uh, that's really, really interesting. And this is important. I, after work with my father in 28 years. I say, how long uh, did you yes, work with your father? Uh, yeah, 28, 28 years. years. It's work, uh, work together. First work like boy, work with my grandfather and my father. My, the series you start with 20 when they finish uh, my school, after make some experience in France. Yes. And this is after 30 years without experience, special to make wine, to make wine in this uh, biodynamic way, organic way is um, so important. And that's uh, important. Your wine is all biodynamic yeah, and yeah, organic, yeah. right? Yeah, that's wonderful. This is for the quality of the grapes is, um, is so important, what, um, which uh, fruit come in the cellar. It's, um, yeah. 90% the job is in the, in in the, the vineyard. Fruit. Yeah, and I see these, what are these symbols down here? This is our symbols for all the uh, symbol for family Simchik. This is your, so this is your family yeah, yes, symbol, yes, yes. yes. Simchik, very nice. And you put them on all three, yeah. And uh, how many uh, bottles of wine will come out of these? I make uh, 4,000 bottles for uh, this wine. But now we change, this is the old. Yeah, this is you the sell, and today is come another uh, two uh, of this. Like this. Yeah. And uh, for two weeks come another two for the start. First time make the Merlot inside to make one prova to make Merlot in one year in the country. Just the vinification in one yeah. year yeah. and another three year in the bar. Oh, nice, nice. Whereas for the make Merlot, um, the Opoca, the Grand Cru is four year. Normally is the four year in the bar. Ah. And now I make first year, uh, this year, just one part to make in the cement for five. So right now you're harvesting the grapes and bringing them in. So is this the most exciting time of year for you? Or what's the, what's the most exciting part of the year for you uh, as you're winemaking? Yeah, it's harvest. It's absolutely harvest, full. Yeah. And uh, the normal is in the... Um, June, July, where is the many green work in the vineyards to some selected to put this and the bottling is in June 
and July and August is uh, summer is for us is very intense. Mm -hmm. My harvest now one month is uh, like work uh, sometimes 16 hours uh, yeah. a day. Whereas when you start fermentation and uh, make the betonage, taste the juice, uh, look the grapes is so important. Okay, I'm nice team. With me is um, this, my cousin yeah. and all family. Uh, for this is uh, is the great job for all, all team now for uh, one month. Nice. So here I see um, many barrels. Yeah. And you have the ribola that's one year in the uh, in the concrete. Uh, Excellent. Now one year in the, the one year in the barrel. Seventeen. It's here in the concrete. Is come eighteen. Eighteen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where is the ribola? Is the last of for the maturation for yeah. this is the harvest is the last is uh, ribola normally it's middle of october mm -hmm. this year maybe in the start of uh, october where is earlier. two weeks is early yeah. this year uh, here is uh, now is ribola this uh, it's a wood grand crew this is the wood x is uh, my experiment in 2014 is the first time and the same x egg shape where is the gravitation the wine is working a little bit in a um, different way for this is a um, nice special this for the long maturation, this yes. uh, skin contact uh, wine. This is your family, right? Yeah, yeah so family is Ivan, my cousin Yanis, and my <laughs> son Leonardo. Come on, and go this is, uh, It's important to, yes. to the try the wine, not just in the bottle, the finish, whereas for making wine it's important uh, tasting many times for in the time of the maturation. No? Okay. Yes. Guys, uh, for me, it's a 16, it's one um, great vintage. And look, it's very nice, um, old goldy color. Yes. It's a little bit umbra. And this, uh, now its smell is very close, but it's the wine in the process, uh, the maturation. Uh, and after one year, it's bottling. And yeah. some months in the bottle uh, is good for, for drink. Cheers. 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 Nazdravia in Slovenian. Nazdravia. Tan is very phenolic and this is, is typical from Rebola to skin contact. It's very unique grape. Yeah, very unique. Yeah. Very tasty soil. This uh, stones from Opoca. Is the this is the, um, yes, uh, is the limestone. This here is called um, Opoca. Opoca. And then inside is called Ponca. And it's uh, very slate from many minerals and yes. very, so very calcar. And that's what you call the wine also. Yeah. 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 And for our line, uh, the Grand Cru, I call uh, Opoca, where it's the very influenced, um, the taste that is uh, Opoca. And the so Grand Cru is the top yeah, level, so yeah, wine. So you happy with it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so th this is your smallest production, this wine? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, about 4,000, 4,500 bottles. Mm. It's from this the Grand Cru, yeah. Wow. So uh, what are we going to taste next? Yeah, to taste uh, the Pinot Noir. Oh, it's nice. a 17. It's like variety you, where you the harvest today. We just saw, yeah. And uh, now this is the 17. It's one year more. So Where it's 2017? 2017. And how long has it been in the uh, barrel? Now it's one year uh, in November. It's one year here in November after the move in the small bars. Uh -huh. Where it's 16 come in the tank to bottling. And 17 is the move in the small bar. For this is one year here and one and a half year in the small bar. How was 2017 compared to 2018? It's 17, it's some problem in the some vineyards, not in these vineyards, this where is uh, the, the hair. Thank you. And uh, is the destroy some like 20% the, the grapes, but the quality, is, uh, it's, uh, it's good. So it's a lower yield, but just yeah. a good quality, yeah. This is red, no, it's not red mm -hmm. with intense like color like um, another variety like yeah. Merlot. My, it's, uh, it's very intense, very nice uh, fruit taste, mm. especially these cherries, mm -hmm. the small uh, black cherries. Yes. And, um, and the strawberry, the small um, Tubosco. And after you nice, um, nice tannin, and very, mm, very long, delicious. very pleasant. Mm. It's very, very typical uh, Pinot, ca Pinot, yeah. Pinot color. No, yeah. it's Ruby. not yeah. red. Yes, Ruby, it's, yeah. mm. this merit is to make the balance. Where is the high concentration? This is alcohol, thirteen point five. Mm -hmm. It's uh, about six of acidity, and nice mineral. And this is to make the, this um, harmony and the, this. Yeah. Um, balance in uh, the wine for special Pinot Noir, all these varieties, the very delicate, it's not 
it's not just to concentrate, it's yeah. not men, it's more, more woman taste. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> or good wine is a, as a drink, no, just who is make, just experience and not as the drink is. How often do the, does the family get together and have wine? Oh, Every they finish day. the Every bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I like this family. Yes. You any room for adoption? Yeah. You're looking for another brother? <laughs> of course, all of them. Well, now you know how much passion and elegance there are to these world-class Slovenian wines. That interview really expressed it in a very profound way. I'm glad that we could share it with you. I one time was uh, at dinner with someone and they, they took a sip of wine and they almost made like a face and said, oh, this wine is very tannic. What, what are tannins and what does it mean when a wine is tannic? Tannins are uh, found in the grape in, uh, in three different areas. They can be in the seed, mm -hmm. they can be in the skin, and can be in the grasp, so in the woody part of. And the tannic is uh, best described as if you make yourself uh, a tea mm -hmm. uh, without sugar you, and you drink uh, this, uh, this heavy tea, your mouth dries out. And the tannic are a component coming from the wood that dries your mouth. But also, as they dry your mouth, they are able to elevate because combining with sugar, acidity, and a little bit of age, they elevate the structure of the wine. And when you're talking about the wood, you're talking about the barrels that they're aged in? So, uh, no, I was talking about the stem, the seeds, and the skin. Then, uh, uh, as you age uh, your wine, you can use uh, wood uh, tanks, barriques, or tonneaux, or big, uh, to add a little bit of this tannic mm -hmm. from a, an external source that doesn't come directly from the plant. So you use the example of tea. So when I oversteep a tea, it makes me kind of pucker. So that, that's what the tannins are? Those are the, 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 the tannic uh, in, uh, in wine. Is it true that uh, sometimes when wines are built to lay down for a long time in age, they, they have usually higher tannins in them and that allows them to age longer? Uh, they do. In fact, uh, most of those wines are, after the fermentation process and the aging process starts, they are aged in barriques, or to know, so the smaller... Uh, the and let's describe what that is, so barrique is the smaller barrel? The barrique is uh, one of the smallest, and so the, there is more wood to wine ratio, and mm -hmm. as the container gets big, there is, there is less um, provided uh, surface, mm -hmm. and so there are less added uh, tannins. But usually, yes, the wines that are made for aging, they require a high level of acidity and, and, tann and tannicity mm -hmm. uh, in order to age for a long time. My next interview is with Simon Simcic. Now you might say, are they all named Simcic? Uh, obviously there's family roots there and in this winemaking region, a lot of them share common uh, heredity. So uh, Simon Simcic, a little bit of a different person. He's a wealthy businessman. He has many hobbies that include racing boats all over the world. But I have to tell you, this thing called wine is something he has a great passion about. And even though it's not his core business, it's something that's very traditional in his family very impressive wine cellar that he gave us a tour of. And even though his main business is not the wine business, he certainly has his hand in it and he does an excellent job with it. Enjoy this interview. Simon, thanks so much for taking some time and uh, letting us come into your home and uh, have this conversation. Your family goes back quite a few generations here, and uh, we were having a conversation about the history of this whole region, which is, is, yeah. which is quite fascinating. But uh, how did winemaking end up in your family? Well, winemaking was part of, in this region, since centuries. Mm -hmm. So it was what uh, the farmers and the wine growers did at the time. It was all, it was a very, very poor region, extremely poor region. If we look only at the early 40s and, uh, and 30s uh, of the previous century, having food on the table was a very important mission of each day. Yeah. Um, prosperity came with um, the building of the cooperative cellar. Mm -hmm. And this is when also the wine production in the region became more professional and uh, started to also go outside the borders of this region. 
uh, many, many years ago, um, uh, let's say during the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the wine was already, of course, produced. It was also a way of paying things, so mm -hmm. with grapes. And uh, Rebula, for instance, which is our autochton grape variety, mm -hmm. was considered as the most expensive currency at the time when, when you made a transaction in Italy, in Gradisca, for instance, a very old town clo uh, close by where all these exchanges were, were made now. But uh, as I said before, professionally, wine production started uh, uh, according to also international standards uh, in the early 50s. And at the time, you must know that uh, the government, it was a socialist country, so everything was decided by the central government. Mm -hmm. And the government wanted to build a cellar in Nova Gorica, which is a town between the region of Brda and the region of Vipava, both known for wine, mm -hmm. both very different regions. And this was, would have been a catastrophe at the time to combine two regions in one yeah. cellar, plus the cellar being far away from each region. Right. And uh, my grandfather was one of the uh, individuals who fought at the time so that two cellars were built, one in Brda mm -hmm. and one in Vipava. He was always the, also the technological su supervisor and uh, uh, for both cellars, plus another one in Serbia, mm -hmm. and later also the oenologist and the director. So from the early 50s, when the wine cellar was built, uh, then the production was, was done on a more professional level. And in my family, wine production, uh, if, if, if we talk about this period, started with my grandfather. And uh, he studied in the University of Ljubljana and in Conegliano, which was the most famous Italian school for oenologists. Mm -hmm. And when he finished, he came back. And uh, that's when the story with the cellar started. Mm -hmm. And uh, early 50s, the cellar was built and they started production. Now, you have businesses outside of wine you know, yeah. that, you're, that you're very involved in. Why do you keep the wine business? Well, wine for us was always the topic of conversation at dinner, for instance. Whenever we would go to visit my grandparents, uh, we always had a very small table. Us kids would sit around. Mm -hmm. in, in the back, uh, the parents at one side, the grandparents at, at another. I remember my grandfather would always bring out a bottle. Didn't matter which bottle, it could be worth a whole lot or very little. Mm -hmm. Uh, if he decided it's time to open it, he opened it. Uh, we tasted it. Uh, as a young guy, I, as a young fellow, I tasted bottles old 30, 40 years even. And um, his philosophy was always when you have a bottle, you, you have to keep it, but empty. A full bottle, you never know what, how much it's worth now. It's worth <laughs> when you tasted it. Now. Then, you, and then you decide how much it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> so the bottles he liked, he kept them, but they were always empty. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a great philosophy, because a lot of times people are wine collectors like me, and my wife gets upset with me because she said, I wish I married a wine consumer, not a wine collector, because... Uh, the bottles are full, <laughs> but that's a good thing. You can drink them and still have well, the bottle. Each wine has a certain period when it, uh, it, uh, it gains in, in, in quality. No? Yeah. But once it peaks, it has to be opened. Yeah. All, all the time later, it's, it's lost of quality and, uh, and opportunity no? yeah. to having tasted it when it was at its peak. Yeah, those are good points. Now, can you try to imagine uh, how life would have been different for you growing up and for your family if there was no wine? It would have been very different. Um, you must know, I, I didn't live much in Slovenia mm, f during my life. No. We moved to Italy, very close by, but right across the border in, uh, in 89. Mm -hmm. I went to an international school, American actually, mm -hmm. all my elementary and junior high. Mm -hmm. I came back here for my high school in Nova Gorica, and then I moved back out again to, uh, uh, to Switzerland for a liberal arts college, again, American school. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, uh, it, uh, well, having gone to college, I couldn't wait to get out <laughs> as a true teenager. No? Yeah, I would say it's not true of all of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, this liberal arts college, Franklin College, it was a very small college, 200 students mm -hmm. roughly and uh, 55 different nationalities. Wow. And uh, you got, I got to meet a lot of, of, of the world's cultures, uh, people from all over the world. And it made me appreciate Sl Slovenia. Mm -hmm. As I said before, uh, winemaking has been here for centuries in my family as well. Uh, my grandfather was a renowned oenologist in Yugoslavia and in this region of Berda and Kolio. Mm -hmm. And the conversation was always wine at, at the dinner table. 
my father, he, uh, uh, he is, we, we, we could say, a successful businessman, mm -hmm. but uh, when, whenever he talked about the grandfather, he always looked and, uh, with aspiration and respect. And mm -hmm. since when I was little, I, it got under my skin. And when I came back from, uh, from, from college, uh, even though I had a position in our company and we had to develop that part, but wine was always a story of, of development. My father, he, uh, after my grandfather retired, he, he, he built him a, a cellar, a small part of what is this uh, today, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, made him possible to, so that he could create with no problems whatever he desired. Mm -hmm. And uh, this hobby was growing, growing, and growing. And then, uh, thank God, it was already time to uh, this hobby to turn it a little bit more uh, uh, up a notch now. Yeah. <laughs> Either make one step forward or two backwards. Of course, we made a step forward. And uh, Medot, your your wine label is uh, focuses on sparkling wines. So yes. Why did you choose, or why did uh, your family choose sparkling wines? Yes. Of course, it was my grandfather's decision. Yes. Um, very briefly, when the cellar was built, uh, he, uh, the capacity of the cellar reached 12 million uh, liters. This is roughly four, 4 million gallons, wow. approximately. Uh, everything produced, everything sold. And at the time when the cellar was built, before reaching this peak, the, the decision had to be made. Which grape variety would prevail? What to plant? Mm -hmm. And everybody wanted to plant uh, international Variety, so mm -hmm. Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, uh, Sauvignon, mm -hmm. and so on. And my grandfather, he decided for Rebula. Rebula must be the primary uh, grape variety because we have Rebula mm -hmm. and nobody else has it. Right. Rebula comes from here. And um, when the cellar reached the peak of uh, this four, 12 million uh, liters, 40% was of Rebula. Mm. And uh, um, he was considered also the father of Rebula, and he, his, all his uh, uh, life was dedicated to valorizing this variety. When he retired in the early 80s, he wanted to valorize in his own cellar and do something that was not possible in the, in the big cooperative cellar. Different wine producers decided to valorize Rebula in different ways. And mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, the masterclass event uh, of this year is a beautiful um, example where people can taste Rebula in different clothings, let's mm -hmm. say, in different uh, forms. Uh, yeah. Yes. And uh, well, my, some people adopted for maceration, others for wood, uh, mm -hmm. sweet wine. Right. My grandfather decided for sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. The reason is he always had this love for sparkling wine, always a very strong love for champagne. Mm -hmm. um, it is a wine that you usually drink when you celebrate. Yes. Churchill would say, even when you lose, no, you, drink, <laughs> you drink your troubles away. No? <laughs> but when you, when, you, when you win, you drink it to victory. No? Right. So he, he used to say that champagne, there's always an occasion. <laughs> And uh, he believed that Rebula, the difference between Rebula and Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, for instance, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and in Champagne, Pinot Meunier, the major varieties, uh, great varieties in Champagne. The difference between Rebula and those two is that Rebula has a lower level of sugar and higher acidity. Mm -hmm. Now, where you make Champagne in uh, France, uh, the climate is completely different than here. So here the Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs tend to mature very fast. Mm -hmm. They reach very high uh, sugar levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you, when you um, uh, harvest them, the acidity starts falling quicker than in, in, in Champagne. No? Mm -hmm. So Rebula is a very good uh, a blend of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and, uh, in order to make it uh, a, a, not only a fresh and good uh, sparkling wine to drink, but also complex, full-bodied, right. and it's, it, it can sustain many years on, on yeasts now. He also always liked very serious products, mm -hmm. so we started, at the time we had one label, the Medot uh, Brut, mm -hmm. which today is Medot Brut Cuvée, mm -hmm. it is the golden label, and um, it was aged around six to seven years on yeasts, and uh, it was always based on the Rebula, mm -hmm. it's around 60%. Mm -hmm. And this gave, it gave freshness uh, to the wine. And then there was Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, which uh, gave the, the vehicle for this long aging, so that yeah. the wine could resist in the bottle 
and still be in its prime when, when it is disgorged after seven years. That takes some time uh, to kind of dial it in to get the right winemaking organized over a period of several growing seasons, I have to imagine, where you say, okay, this is the right combination and the yeah, right methods. Exactly. So year by year, you keep seeing kind of what you come out with. Yeah. So uh, how long did it take before they kind of got, got yeah. you dialed in? Well, we must not forget that he was uh, the main oenologist of the cellar for more than 30 years. Right. So he did gain a lot of experience. Was and he the original he, lead of the co-op that was here? Yeah. Yeah, so he was the original person that, that was the head of it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so he got a lot of experience there. Okay. Yeah. And uh, when he retired, he started to do exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. So in 85 was the first bottle of sparkling wine that came out, based a lot on Rebula. Uh -huh. Then he started adding Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And in 92, he reached 60% Rebula, mm -hmm. 20 Chardonnay, 20 Pinot Noir, and mm -hmm. decided that this is the bottle to age. Right. And uh, then in 92, also the label Medot was created. Mm -hmm. And Medot was his father. Ah. This, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in this region, before the houses, the farms, were known um, as uh, through the names of, of the owners. Mm -hmm. So my great-grandfather was Cyril Metot, and everybody knew him as Medot, and this was Medot's place. Uh -huh. And that's how we, our brand got the name. And this is the interesting thing for people to understand when they're you know, getting a glass of, you know, of uh, sparkling wine or other types of wine from family vineyards that have lasted generations. They're really experiencing something that took many years to get crafted to exactly what's in that glass right now. So not only are you getting you know, the soil and the unique grape, like the Rebula grape, but you're also getting a lot of thinking and effort from the person who actually said, you know, this, well, we're gonna do this, this, this over years and years until they finally say, okay, now we have it the way we want it. Yeah. So there's a depth of appreciation there. I know the, uh, the, the climates are different, as you said, between here and Champagne, and also uh, the varietals would be different that you're using. How do you feel like the quality of the sparkling wines here compared to that in uh, the, you know, the classic area, which is Champagne? Champagne was always the aperitif of the world. Mm -hmm. When you opened the dinner, when you opened the party, if you wanted to show class, you open Champagne. Right. Uh, and, uh, Champagnes are, are very powerful. They have uh, very strong bubbles, mm -hmm. um, uh, persistent bubbles, and, uh, and it was always considered as an aperitif. Mm -hmm. Since many years now, uh, Champagne is trying to shift this perspective of, of what Champagne is towards also the fact that you can open a bottle of Champagne throughout dinner, throughout right. the whole course. The main difference between us um, uh, here in Bird, our particularly Medot and, uh, and uh, Champagnes and other types of sparkling wines, is that we were born, or the field, my grandfather's philosophy was not so much as an aperitif, but a sparkling wine that can accompany the whole dinner. Mm -hmm. So with long aging, you get complexity, mm -hmm. you must maintain the freshness, uh, but all a very important thing is that the bubbles become very, very fine. Mm -hmm. They're not so explosive in, uh, in the mouth, which permits for the aromas to de develop and sense them better. And also it does not um, uh, fill the stomach so much because if you drink a lot, a lot, a lot of bubbles, yeah, you feel bloated. plus you eat, <laughs> yeah. you, you feel all that now. So, uh, but this you only get with a very long aging. Now. For this reason, if, if for instance, our Millesim, our vintage, which will hit the market actually next month, mm -hmm. is a 2010 vintage. Mm -hmm bottled in 2011 and this gorge recently. So it has uh, seven years on yeast. Wow, that's, that's very interesting. So you, so you basically can experience it like a, like a wine, a non-sparkling wine, use it that way, but have the sparkling uh, it is a It is a sparkling wine, yeah. just like Champagne, Franciacorta, yeah. uh, or from Trentino, yeah. also marvelous products, right. and Cava, of course. Cava. Uh, but our characteristics, as you also find them in the other regions, but Specifically for us, it's that it is a it is a gourmet sparkling wine yeah, that yeah. can accompany a variety of food, and it can be drank all, all through dinner. Um, so now, uh, do you have children? Yes, I do. So, uh, do you get around the table and open wine with them and talk about the wine? And how's the tradition going on? Yes. <laughs> so, I have two daughters. Mm -hmm. 
the smaller one is uh, three years old. Uh -huh. She is the one that likes wine the most, <laughs> <laughs> but she cannot taste it. <laughs> she only likes to pour the finger inside. Can I taste, please? And can I have, have some more? Can I have some? <laughs> That's and great. If we and my wife have plans that night, we say, yeah, sure, go on. <laughs> <laughs> if not, no. <laughs> The older daughter, she's uh, she, she, she's going to be ten now in mm -hmm. uh, in September, and uh, of course uh, she doesn't like wine. Yeah. But we we tend to, and this is something also I got from my grandfather. He always made us try. Yes. We would never like it. Oh no, please <laughs> not the wine. But certain things remained. Yes. Uh, in your back memory now. So this is something I like to carry out as well, and uh, yeah. we make them try the wines. Uh, well, not the very little one. <laughs> But uh, Sophia, the older one, and uh, just a, a small sip. Just yeah. smell this. What do you feel? And slowly, slowly, also she, I think, will will start to gain a perception of, of what is good, what is not, what she likes, what she doesn't. Yeah. Of course, later on. No? Yes. <laughs> but what's interesting is that it also, you know, the, that means the family's together for dinner. You know, to have this experience, and it adds to yeah. the experience because so often, at least I know in America now, a family dinner is not that common like it used to be. And uh, my my ancestors came from Italy, you know, so that you know I remember having to sit for hours with my great grandfather and you know his wine that he made, you know, yeah. and we weren't allowed to leave the table till he was done. So everybody it was, was a big deal. Huh? Yeah, it was a big deal. So yeah. uh, so it's it's interesting in the winemaker's home, you know, to see how now the new generation coming in and, and what the experience is, but that's a tradition that keeps carrying on. Yeah, which I think is now when they're you know uh, older and they have kids of their own, you know, it, it kind of keeps perpetuating. Even though maybe they don't like uh, wine now, do I have to try it? Like you said, that you know you remember it, and, yeah. and so yeah. will they. Yeah, I'd like to think that it will leave a, a footprint, and yeah. that uh, and that they will do similarly with their kids and so on. And these are the traditions, and I believe how the traditions are yeah. carried on from generation to generation. So uh, are there um, any specific values that Medot holds as far as you know what their wine is about or how it's made that stand out? Rebula is at the center of of our winemaking. Of of of, of uh, uh, it was always at the center of my grandfather. Uh, whatever he developed, he tried to incorporate Rebula inside. He mm -hmm. always tried to put Rebula in the right place. It is a grape variety very well known in Italy, but not so much uh, elsewhere. And mm -hmm. only recently it started to gain a lot in, uh, in attention, also from exterior wine connoisseurs, mm -hmm. but uh, also from media. Yes. And um, even we, whatever we develop, and uh, we are developing, we are growing. Uh, we have, as you have seen outside, we are almost finished with uh, the last part of the, of the new cellar, mm -hmm. uh, we are buying vineyards, and uh, and we believe in the region. We believe in, in in winemaking, and we would like to one day that this would be one of the main uh, uh, activities we make, no? not just our hobby and our right. small diamond, let's say. Uh, and Rebula will always be at the heart of, of this. No? Whatever in whatever direction it, it it will be taken, Rebula must always be the. The, the main driver of whatever is going to come out. And it's interesting because the, the feeling I get in Berta, uh, here in Slovenia, is um, it's almost like a, a national pride. You know, it's like you, there, you, know, that there's, you have a flag, you know, the grape is almost like, like a flag you know, for this region saying, this is where we're unique, this is what expresses the, the terroir you know, that we have, this is the uh, you yeah, this is just um, the pride and, and what we want to bring to the world and have people can, you can take a, a bottle of, uh, of wine that's Rebula based wine and send it anywhere in the world and now they'll, they'll know Berta and they'll have an understanding of Slovenia. Yeah, well this has already been proven in, in the past. Mm -hmm. People know it, it, it can work but it takes time and uh, as we discussed earlier Slovenia is a very very young country. Yeah. Before, when, when it was Yugoslavia, at the peak of the winery uh, in, the, in the 70s and early 80s, uh, Re, Rebula was the, primarily, the primary grape variety in Yugoslavia. It was mm -hmm. the most successful. Uh, I think it also, in between white, fresh wines, it was the most expensive. Mm -hmm. And it was always, all the volume was sold. 
and it was like the buzz wine, or it, it was the wine that everybody wanted to mm -hmm. taste. No? Um, in, the, in the middle 80s and late 80s, and uh, especially in the early 90s, uh, the, the cellar and the whole region, all of Yugoslavia collapsed, and the, um, the cellar also lost a little bit the right drive and the right direction. Mm -hmm. So there were some bad years, and uh, recently, again, it is gaining in uh, in appreciation, uh, the wines every year are winning a lot of medals, yeah. which many years ago we never really uh, went outside of the Slovene borders. No, but the Rebula at the time it won. It was then named the the Golden Rebula because ten years consecutive consecutively it won the Golden Medal, uh, medal yeah. at the international um, wine tasting in Ljubljana, where wines would come from all over the world, mm -hmm. primarily Europe at the time, but also all, all over the world. No? So it was already a very successful grape variety mm -hmm. at the time. Of course, vinification processes changed, trends changed. Sure. You went from fresh to extremely rich wines, now back to fresh. We will go also back again to rich wines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is always a fluctuation yeah. yes. you know, of decades. And, uh, and uh, we are sure that Rebula will be successful. And uh, this lately, in the late years, in the, in the last uh, few years, um, many wine producers who make Rebula as impurity, as, uh, as, as wine has gained a lot of, uh, of appreciation and affirmation from contests all over the world that uh, it is the right direction and it is a great, a great grape variety. Yeah. And what is most importantly today, it is still relatively unknown in, in the world now. Yeah. So there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of, it's exciting, the opportunity, uh, you know, that, that seems to be, the timing is really good for this to explode yeah. onto the market. But with this comes also a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, as a region, we are learning more and more how to collaborate, mm -hmm. how to take decisions together. And again, the masterclass is a perfect ex yeah. example. And people must decide roughly in what direction to, we, we must go. And the most important de uh, decision has been made mm -hmm. and we're all happy about it. And, and it is that Rebula must be the center of our, uh, let's say, core value of our beliefs of yeah. what we must produce in this region, which is very small compared mm -hmm. to other regions. No, it is extremely small. You can drive across it in 10 minutes, no? yeah. 15, let's say. But it's beautiful on the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Simon, very much for, uh, for sharing the story and sharing the story of your family with us. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming. So, Simon, uh, tell me about your wine cellar here. Well, right now we are in our archive. Mm -hmm. Meaning that uh, here is where we keep the vintages. Mm -hmm. You know, when you make sparkling wine, a uh, good thing is that you can produce non-vintages. Right. It takes care that the quality is stable mm -hmm. and you mix various vintages. But every once in a while comes that vintage where you just want to bring it out and mm -hmm. show it to everybody. And we do that as well. Uh, and uh, here is where we store then once the bottles get uh, off the market, we store a very small portion of the volume mm -hmm. uh, in here. Oh, that's great. For more aging on cork now. And I see that you, you uh, mark the different areas with the actual year, so that's how you yes. know what's yes. what. Yes, and it's interesting that you don't put labels on them. But you, you, know, you know that those are all 2001, but I guess because the labels over time will come off, or why do you not label them? Well, it, because then, yes, the, it's not only they, they come off, they also become, let's say... Um, moldy? Moldy, yeah. altered. Yeah. Uh, but uh, mainly bec because these are the bottles set aside, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe we'll label them one time. We still have all, all, all of the labels, sure. but they're here uh, in the same, let's say, uh, uh, way they were before they, they hit the market now. Now, earlier you talked about how uh, people in this wine region are starting to uh, cooperate and how important it is that they come together. And I noticed that uh, you have uh, some bottles here that look like they were given you know, to you and your cellar that are not yours, but from uh, Jormin, another uh, you know, yeah. local person. Yeah, for instance, uh, we also have a sailing project. Mm -hmm. uh, with Jermann, we're very good friends. Uh -huh. They came together through my grandfather. Uh -huh. Jermann has a very big respect for him, and this is how also we, we met and we share some common visions. 
And uh, every year when we would uh, invite him to our main event, our main sailing event, mm -hmm. he would dedicate us one of his bottles and uh, paint the picture of our boat with uh, with his um, dedication. Dedication, or, yeah. yeah. So and that's yeah. So that he paid a picture, and that's one of his bottles. Yeah. So. So that's that's a very nice gift to come from someone who could look at you as a competitor, but yeah. instead yes, yeah, says that no, he wishes you well. Yes, he, he Yerman has a very clear vision. He always promoted collaboration between both sides. Mm -hmm. He also owns vineyards in Berda and yeah. speaks very openly about it. And uh, right now he's hitting the market with a bottle that is produced exclusively from the grapes from Berda. Yeah, that's interesting. And what is your view of him as a as a winemaker and what he means to the region? He is a true professional, very, very uh, oriented uh, uh, man. He is very precise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I could describe him best by saying that he is an artist, but also a mathematician at, at the same time. Yeah, he's got the, both the left and right sides of his exactly. brain working. And b both of them combined to, to, together and very focused towards where he wants to go. Terrific. So uh, tell me about this book. Ah, this is interesting. This book dates back to 1880. Mm -hmm. At the time, the castle in Dobrovo was owned by Count de Baguer. Mm -hmm. Count de Baguer lived in Gorizia, a medieval town not far from here. Mm -hmm. And this was his summer residence mm -hmm. and his cellar. Uh -huh. He used to produce wine. And uh, this is a book written by himself. And uh, it is where he explained the whole wine process, the technology of that time. Wow. He documented it, everything. And uh, my great-great-grandfather, he was a uh, confidant with the Count. The Count also sometimes came to visit mm -hmm. at, at the time and, and they would talk under uh, two trees that are still here. Uh -huh. and, uh, and he gave him this book uh, as a present. Wow. I mean, it, it, you know, it's a handwritten book painstaking detail, you know, pictures. Yeah. Uh, and this was basically just the whole process of making wine laid out from that period exactly. of time. What a great piece to have in, in your archives here. Yeah, we also thought of, uh, of uh, um, uh, digitalizing it mm -hmm. and uh, so that it can be actually uh, re Printed. reprinted. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that would be a good idea. And studied maybe. Even. I would buy one. Yeah. <laughs> Except I can't read it, it'd have to be interpreted also. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in Italian. Yeah. Well, I can do a little bit of Italian, maybe. I'll get my uh, relatives to help me. Simon is pretty impressive, isn't he? And it's a different tone, isn't it? When someone has a passion about wine, it's not their central focus or not their main means of making a living, but nonetheless, they still have this passion and this drive to create great wines and put them out into the world. The term acidity is used very often. Obviously, it means there's a certain amount of acid in the wine. Um, how do you experience acidity when you drink a wine? Acidity, you have an immediate reaction, like salivation is something that we all know. Once you drink a, um, a high acid wine, you start salivating, you're almost your mouth start wrinkling. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely acidity is one of the uh, more important uh, components in wine. Uh, the more the acidity, usually the more the age that wine can have, mm -hmm. and the more complexity because uh, the higher you have, the more tannic you can put, the more uh, fruit you can put to make a bigger wine and like everything else uh, you know there's there's uh, you don't want too much it's there's a certain balance that you want but it's an important component it is a, a very very important component um, it is is also very pleasant because acidity uh, stimulates the salivation and cleans your palate every time so it's a uh, it's a uh, fresher uh, sometimes acidity is uh, combined with freshness that is uh, more used and refer for white wine right. but it's a foundation for red wines as well you're talking about a, a salivary response to uh, acidity, so this must also tie into food, right? Critical. Uh, it's, uh, when you have a great food and wine uh, pairing, mm -hmm. uh, you're looking for 50% um, from the wine and 50% from the food. Right. So if a food is very fatty, is very heavy, it's very big, you want a very high acidity wine to wash and clean your mouth and imbalance it. Mm -hmm. If you have a very acidic food, you might want a little bit more a sugary wine right. or a calmer wine. So the two are critically important to be paired uh, together.
Well, that's it for episode three. I know there's a ton of content here and great content. I want you to know that you can own Wine Revealed. So on this page, there's a button. If you wanna own this so you can revisit this content over and over again and share it with others, that's the way to do it. We appreciate you. I appreciate you spending time with me and I can't wait to see you in episode four. Prove it. Test. Test. Mm. It's good. Very nice. So this is the maceration process. Yes. So what does that mean exactly? That means that you fermented the grape in the contact with the skin. That like the maceration was made for extract the color from the red grape. I'm a big lover of blended wine and the important philosophy is, is that we work with a lot of local grapes from the old vineyards and then we look that all of the wine are with nice taste and that are very drinkable then. Il mio modo di pensare. At a certain point he understood that he had to change and it was when he understood that it is not necessary in life to produce wine or better. It's not only to earn money and so he had to change most of the things he learned in order to reduce quantity and work only on quality. <laughs> <laughs>